This programme is about electricity, how much we use, what effect generating it has on our environment and where we might get our electricity from in the future. But first we're going to find out how much electricity a typical household uses in a day. From first thing in the morning to last thing at night, we all rely on electricity. Hey, I was watching that. We measure electricity in units. One unit is the amount used when a 100 watt light bulb is on for 10 hours. Each day, a typical household uses about nine units. In a year, that's 3,285 units of electricity. Add up all the houses in the UK and the total is about 100,000 million units. That's 100 with nine noughts after it. Add this to the amount used every day by industry, transport and agriculture and the grand total is a massive 300,000 million units every year. All this electricity is available day and night at the flick of a switch. So how is it generated? To generate electricity you need three things. A magnet, a coil of wire and movement. Turn the magnet and the needle rises and you're producing electricity. The movement of a magnet near a coil of wire generates an electric current. This simple action is all you need. Keep the magnet moving and you'll have a constant supply of electricity. Here at Drax Power Station they generate a huge amount of electricity. They use big coils of wire and massive magnets. This is a generator. Inside is a magnet which is as long as a bus and it's spinning 3,000 times every minute. And surrounding the magnet are hundreds of coils of wire. To move the magnets, power stations like this start by burning a fuel to heat up water. It's heated inside metal boilers and pipes, so you can't see it. But as the water gets hot, it turns into steam, just like the steam from a kettle. When it pushes against the blades of a turbine, the turbine spins. The same sort of thing is happening inside the generator. As the turbine spins, the magnet spins inside a coil of wire, generating electricity. At Drax, they heat up thousands of litres of water every day, which means they need plenty of fuel. They burn coal to heat the water. In fact, it's the biggest coal-fired power station in Western Europe. The coal is brought by train from a nearby pit. By burning about 40 trainloads a day, they produce enough electricity to meet the daily needs of around 4 million people. Drax is one of many power stations in the UK, and most burn fossil fuels. About 32% of our electricity comes from burning coal. Another 32% from burning gas and just 2% from oil. That's two-thirds of our electricity generated from fossil fuels. The problem is that even though there's enough of these fuels to last for the next 100 years or so, they're damaging to the environment. Burning fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide gas into the atmosphere. This adds to the greenhouse effect and is thought to be changing our climate. Burning coal also releases sulphur and nitrogen into the atmosphere, causing acid rain. So, can power stations do anything to stop these harmful gases getting into the air? At Drax, the clouds leaving the cooling towers may look like smoke, but in fact it's harmless water vapour. That chimney up there is where the exhaust gases leave. But first, any ash or oxides of sulphur are removed. 
This power station spends a lot of money cleaning up the gases that they release into the atmosphere. In this part of the plant behind me, they remove the sulphur. And to give you an idea of the size of the operation, those pipes are wider than the channel tunnel. But even if they clean up their exhaust gases, there's no getting away from the fact that all fossil fuel power stations still release carbon dioxide. One alternative is to use nuclear fuel like uranium. It already provides us with 30% of our electricity. Nuclear power stations produce hardly any acidic gases and emit virtually no carbon dioxide. But they still pose problems for the environment. The fuel is radioactive and there are real worries about how to dispose of the dangerous waste that's produced. Another problem with coal, oil, gas and nuclear fuels is that we've only got a limited resource. So eventually we're going to run out. We need to look for alternatives. At the moment, the remaining slice of electricity, just 4% of the total, is generated by using less harmful energy sources. So what are they? For a start, is there anything else we can burn? Well, this cheeky chap is a bit of a clue. No, you can't burn chickens. Something that chickens produce. And I don't mean eggs. The fuel that they use here at Fibrogen Power Station is chicken litter. That's chicken poo to you and me. The chicken litter is a byproduct of the poultry industry and it arrives by the lorry load from local farms. It contains wood shavings, straw and chicken droppings. From here, it's picked up by a crane and transported towards the furnace. The temperature inside is an incredible 850 Celsius. This makes sure that any bacteria in the chicken litter are destroyed and turns water in the boiler pipes to steam. The steam turns the turbine at this end, which in turn turns the magnet at this end, and that's how you get electricity. Burning 30 lorry loads of chicken litter a day can produce enough electricity to meet the needs of 13,500 homes. The generator at Fibrogen works on the same principle as the one at Drax. It's just a lot smaller and the fuel is a bit more unusual. The best thing about this place is that much less harm is being done to our environment. You see, the fuel it's burning isn't adding any extra carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Chicken litter is digested plant material and those plants took in carbon dioxide to grow in the first place. So burning the litter simply returns that carbon dioxide back into the air. Good, eh? Thankfully, for the workers and people who live nearby, it isn't too smelly. A clever flow of air through the plant means the nasty odours are contained in the fuel hall. So Nick, you're the plant manager. What are the disadvantages? The disadvantage is that the, the availability of chicken litter is limited, so the size of this type of station is limited, although we could burn other biomass material. Any organic material that can be used as a source of energy is known as a biomass fuel. It's a serious alternative to burning fossil fuels. Fibrogen UK is one of several biomass power generators dotted around the country. One of the most obvious biomass fuels is wood. Willow and eucalyptus trees are ideal because they're fast growing. Farmers cultivate and harvest the trees like any other crop. And Britain's first wood-fired power station is now in production. Other schemes don't just burn biomass, they burn all kinds of household waste too. All these fuels are renewable, which means there's an endless supply, so we won't run out. What alternative fuels are available near you? If you live out in the countryside, could food production or farming provide a useful fuel? 
If you live in a town, maybe the waste from local industries or household rubbish is the answer. Whatever fuel you choose, you'll have to think about the sort of gases that might be produced. Look for alternatives that have as little effect on the environment as possible. Here's one for you. What is 50 metres high, weighs 50 tonnes and can provide enough electricity for up to a thousand homes and doesn't burn a single thing? A wind turbine. And imagine what you could do with loads of them like this. And I think they look really cool. Wind has been used as a source of energy for 4,000 years. High-tech and graceful turbines like these can now be found on hilltops dotting the countryside. As the wind blows, it pushes against the blades and they swing into action. Just like the other power stations, this turning motion moves magnets inside coils of wire at the top of the mast. When all of the turbines here at Royd Moor operate at full pelt, they produce enough electricity to meet the needs of 13,000 homes. Well, come on, let's go and have a look. What a letdown. It's just an empty space. Apart from this control panel, which monitors the instruments at the top of the tower and keeps the blades facing into the wind. The electricity is generated at the top and transmitted via cables to the base of the tower. I'm going to meet David Farrier from Yorkshire Wind Power, the man who knows all there is to know about these turbines. So what are the advantages of using wind turbines to produce electricity? Wind is a clean, safe and infinite renewable energy source. For each unit of electricity generated from a wind farm, one less unit is generated from a coal-fired power station. This helps reduce the emission of gases that contribute towards global warming. And what are the downsides? Some people consider wind farms attractive, others consider them an eyesore. Uh, we try to take this into account when we're designing wind farms, but often the best sites are on higher ground, so we can't actually hide them. I think the other thing is that, of course, the wind doesn't blow all the time. So we wouldn't expect to produce all our electricity from wind farms, but they can make a significant contribution to our energy needs. How much wind do you need to actually make the turbines turn around? For wind turbines here at Royd, uh, they require at least four metres per second before they start producing electricity. Uh, but if we're looking for a good wind farm site, we'd be looking for an average wind speed of at least seven metres per second. And what about the noise? Do you get any complaints? Well, as you can hear today, wind turbines aren't noisy. Part of the design process for uh, a wind farm is to carry out noise studies to ensure that noise levels at nearby properties are such that they won't disturb the residents. The great thing about a wind turbine is that the land below can still be used by farmers, but they need to be in fairly exposed areas. This means they're often built in the middle of the countryside, and although the turbines are quiet, some people aren't sure that they like the look of them. I thought they might ruin the environment, they might spoil the view, but I think now that they're built, they don't. I live a long way from here, and so I don't often get to see the windmills, but when I do, I think they look great. I've lived in this area for two years, so I wasn't around to see the windmills being built, but now they're here, I think they look really good against the horizon. I can see the windmills from a bedroom window, and they're really obvious, so perhaps I need some camouflage. Every morning when I come to school, I see these windmills on the horizon, and every night when I go home, I see three polluting power stations in the other direction. I prefer this way of producing electricity. But not everyone wants a wind farm on his or her doorstep. And not every location is windy enough, so electricity companies are looking to offshore wind farms as a way forward, like these off the coast of Denmark. At sea, the wind turbines are out of sight and the wind is more reliable. But you don't always have to think big. A small turbine is providing this houseboat with a free source of electricity. So is there a good site for a wind farm near you? You need an average wind speed of at least 7 metres per second and an open space, well away from people's homes.
there are several other ways of generating electricity that don't require burning fuels. Hydroelectricity is generated when the energy of falling water is harnessed to make turbines spin. Oceans also represent a huge, untapped source of clean and renewable energy. The idea is to use the movement of waves or the tides to drive turbines. But electricity can also be generated without depending on any movement at all. Ah, now this is my idea of generating electricity. Sunbathing. You probably use solar power without even thinking about it. Most calculators contain a tiny solar panel which catches the sun's light and converts it into electricity. And what about the hat? Solar panel drives the fan. But those solar panels are tiny compared to this. What could you do with a panel that's this big? This is the first house in the UK where the whole roof can convert sunlight into electricity. The roof is covered with special tiles. When light falls on these tiles, they directly convert the light energy to electricity. There's no need for a coil of wire, a magnet or any movement. It's a completely different way of generating electricity. On a typical day, this house uses the sun to produce enough electricity to meet all its needs and more. It can generate enough to make 350 cups of tea, or you could watch 100 episodes of Scientific Eye. Claire Horton works for Solar Century, who are keen to encourage people to think solar. Thanks, Claire. That's okay. So what's the best things about solar power? It's clean, it's non-polluting, it's completely renewable, it can be put anywhere, and it generates electricity at point of need. And do the tiles work even when it's cloudy? Absolutely. They only need daylight to work, so they work in cloudy conditions and even if it rains. So if it's so good, why are we not all using it? The technology's been used on things like satellites and space stations for the last 40 years, but it's only just started to be used on roofs. It's efficient, we've proved it. The roof on this house is generating 70% more electricity than the householder is using. Solar power has loads of potential. Just think about all that unused roof space. But the technology is expensive, so it's still rarely used. And here in the UK, there isn't much chance of being able to rely only on solar power, because there simply wouldn't be enough light in the middle of winter. Each different way of generating electricity has its own list of advantages and disadvantages. It's not as simple as flicking on a switch. There's a lot to think about. So where would you want your electricity to come from in the future?